Good evening and welcome to International Observe the Moon Night from here at the National Space Centre in Leicester. Now online tonight we are joining millions of people around the globe as we celebrate observing the moon. So let's kick off with something special with Sophie who's going to be showing us how to make some astronomical treats. Now you can make these along with Sophie. If you look at our Facebook page you'll find all the ingredients and if you do have a go at making them let us know how they turn out and how they taste. So over to you Sophie. Hello I'm Sophie from the National Space Academy and tonight on International Observe the Moon Night, I'm inviting you into my kitchen to show you how you can make your own simple, no-bake, vegan Oreo truffles that will closely resemble my own piece of the moon. This is my piece of a lunar meteorite and you can see that it is composed of light and dark rock that's been fused together as a result of the impact that produced it. Now when you look at the surface of the moon, it's covered in craters. It's being continually smashed into by objects, causing the rock from various areas to be thrown up and scattered across the surface. Now the dark rock in my sample is called basalt, a volcanic rock that's found in the mare or the sea areas of the moon. And the light rock is called a northersite, which comes from the highlands. This recipe will make six lunar truffles. And if you want to make more, you just need to scale it up by doubling or tripling the quantities. You will need 10 Oreo cookies. And you see how these are really dark? These are representing the basalt in our lunar meteorite. To represent the anorthosite, the light coloured rock, we're going to use some chopped nuts. I'm using macadamias here, but you can choose whatever nuts you like, or if you don't have any nuts, you can just take a light coloured biscuit and bash it up into smaller pieces. We're going to need some vegan cream cheese to bind it all together. If you don't have vegan cream cheese and you're not vegan, normal cream cheese will do the job. And we're going to need half a block of dark chocolate and that's going to be to cover the outside of our truffles. As well as that, you're going to need a tub that you can put in the freezer with a lid that's lined with greaseproof or baking paper, a bowl, a fork, and a food processor. So the first thing we need to do is take our Oreos or our basalt analog, and we need to stick them in the blender in the food processor until we make them into small crumbs. Now the cream in between the biscuits is going to do a good job of starting to bind together those crumbs. So we pop them in, pop the lid on, and we want to blend this for about a minute. Take it off and give it a little bit of a shake just to get any larger bits better distributed. And back on. And here we have our blended crummy Oreo basalt. And now we need to mix together the cream cheese. Now with vegan cream cheese particularly, you want to leave it to soften for a little bit. And if it's still a bit hard like this is, you need to give it a bit of a smush before you pop your Oreo crumbs in, just to help it all mix together nicely. So once you've softened your vegan cheese, we can pop our crumbs in. And then you want to get it really well mixed together until all the cream cheese and all those crumbs have been well mixed.
And now that I've got my basalt mixture, I need to take my anorthosite chunks and I need to put them in. Mixing them in with the basalt, just like you get happening when you get a big impact on the surface of the moon, crushing together that highland anorthosite and that lowland basalt. So now we're ready to take our mixture and spoon it out, or in this case fork it out, into blobs on the baking paper. You want to try and get roughly even sized blobs and scoop it onto a finger. Don't worry about making these too perfect, remember that the real lunar meteorites wouldn't be perfectly spherical either, and then pop it down on the greaseproof paper. Repeat that with the rest of the mixture, just trying to get vaguely round shapes, doesn't matter if there are a few extra little bits sticking off, and just make sure that you don't get them sticking together on the paper, otherwise you're going to struggle to get them off later. Now, as you can see at the moment, these are very, very soft and they're going to be a bit of a pain to try and eat. So what we're going to do is we're going to, after we've formed them into these balls, we're going to put the lid on and we're going to stick them in the freezer for about 40 minutes. That'll give them a nice amount of time to firm up, ready for the addition of the chocolate on the outside. So I've popped the lid on my container, I'm going to stick this in the freezer for 40 minutes, give them a chance to firm up and then we'll get on to the next bit. But there's no point in you waiting with me for that 40 minutes, so for now, back to Malika. Thanks Sophie, we'll be back with you a little bit later on just to see how you're getting on. Now we're going to go to our rocket tower and join Emma who's going to tell us about our lunar sample that we have on display here at the National Space Centre. Here at the National Space Centre we have our very own piece of moon rock on deck 4 of our rocket tower. It comes from the Apollo 17 mission from the Shorty Crater and it's about 3.8 billion years old and weighs 67.5 grams. We preserve it in nitrogen because on Earth there's so much oxygen, whereas on the Moon there is none. So to stop it from being eroded or rusted, we preserve it in nitrogen. This is one of three pieces in the UK, and there are less than a thousand kilograms of moon rock on Earth. So if you want to see this for yourself, come down to the National Space Centre in Leicester. Thanks Emma, it's still an amazing artefact to see. And don't forget if you want to see it, then just take the glass lift to the top of our rocket tower when you can see it on deck four. Now we're going to join Alex in our science lab. Now if you're interested in getting into astronomy and want to know more about telescopes, Alex is just going to explain and go through uh, some of the telescopes that you might consider. If you do have any questions, just drop them in the comments. Hello there, my name is Alex. And I'm here at our science lab at the National Space Centre talking about one of the most common questions we get asked. Now we get asked this after we've done a night sky tour or we've spoken about anything else that relates to what we can see up there in space. And that is, what telescope should I buy? Now just like with cars, there is no such thing as a perfect telescope. It all depends on what you want to use it for. So what I'm going to do now I'm going to speak about some of the main things you want to look for in a telescope, whether it be your first telescope, or even your second, third, or even your fourth. So the first thing we're going to look at is what brand you should buy. Now, like with any product, whether it be clothing, soft drinks, or even biscuits, there's a lot of different brands out there, but there's always industry leaders. And there are two names in particular that stand out when it comes to telescopes, and they are Celestron and Orion. Now, there are plenty of other brands of telescope out there, and you're more than welcome to try one of those. But these two are the most renowned and respected names when it comes to buying a telescope. So the rest are a bit more potluck. So if you want to take that doubt away, buy either Celestron or Orion. That would be my advice with the brand. 
Now what you're also going to see is a lot of numbers and a lot of different information coming at you about these telescopes. So I'm going to talk about the main ones you want to look at uh, to try and avoid confusion. The main thing you want to look at when it comes to a telescope is the aperture. And basically this is your main deciding factor. Uh, you may see things written sometimes as a Celestrian 18mm for example. Basically this is your aperture uh, and that is the diameter of your main mirror or lens. The bigger the better, you don't want to go underneath 70. That's all I'm going to say on that one. Uh, if you want to go for 80 or 90 in the first telescope, fantastic if your budget allows that, okay? But please don't go underneath 70 on that. So that's the main thing you want to look for as well. Now also, the distance between your aperture and your uh, focal point gives us the next thing, which is our focal length. Now, depending on what sort of focal length you want, depends on what you want to use it for. If you want to see a vast area of the sky, then I suggest going for a smaller focal length. But if you want to see a small area, uh, but really, really clearly, I suggest going for a higher focal length as well. It depends entirely what you want it for. And that brings us to our maximum magnification. Now, you may see telescopes have all these uh, grand promises that you can see 500, 600 times maximum magnification. It is complete rubbish. Please, please, please ignore this one. It's complete rubbish. You are really, really going to have to put a lot of money into the rest of your scope to be able to get anywhere near what they are promising. Okay, usually it's uh, something that certain telescopes use if the product isn't quite as good, to be quite honest. So please, please, please ignore maximum magnification. You want to concentrate on aperture, and if you need a deciding factor, use the focal length as well. Which brings us to one of the biggest headaches. What type of telescope should you buy? Well, really, it depends on what you want to use it for, because there are two main types of telescope. They are reflector and refractor. Very, very similar names do very, very different things. So if you'd rather look for deep space objects, galaxies, distant stars, uh, you're probably going to want a reflector telescope where if you want to look more at the moon, planets, nearby stars, refractor is probably the way to go. There's other small uh, differences as well. So a reflector is slightly cheaper, more portable, get less image uh, distortion as well. Uh, refractor is slightly easier to use, a little less maintenance, and you don't get any light loss as well because of the way it's made. Um, but really, these are the main two things you want to focus on, which you'd rather see. Okay? Now, there is a third type as well, and that is what we have here. This is a catadioptric telescope, and there are two different types. Okay, So there is a Schmidt Cassegrain, and basically, this is the best of both of these as well. So if you want to have a look, bit of a look at both of them, I suggest going uh, for one of these telescopes as well. Uh, it's also great for photography, compact, and also has little maintenance. And there's a slightly different variation of that as well, which is a Matsutov Cassier grain. Extremely similar to the Schmidt Cassier grain, except you get slightly sharper viewing, but it's also slightly heavier as well, but extremely similar. So really, it depends on what you want to see in the night sky. Now, something else is always worth considering is the size of your telescope. So usually when it comes to the telescopes, bigger telescopes are better, okay? But there's other things you've got to consider. If you buy a telescope this big, for example, where are you going to store it when you're not using it? How many times are you going to use this telescope? Is it going to be worth taking up that much of your house? If you have the space for it, fantastic. Go for this type of telescope. But there are others too. In fact, sometimes you can get telescopes to about this big here. So, uh, this is a tabletop telescope. Uh, so, it's a lot smaller, but it still does a very, very good job. And in fact, this is my first telescope. Um, it's an Orion, it's got a 100 millimeter aperture on it. It's a Matatov Cassie grain as well, so a good all-rounder. And basically, what it means, because it's a tabletop, I, I've just got to take uh, some sort of table for it to rest on when I take it out to view the night sky. It cost me around 160 pounds, so this really is perfect for what I needed. But again, what you may want to look at may be very, very different. If you're still undecided on what telescope to go for, then look at what extras you can get with it as well. So every telescope should have at least a couple of decent eyepieces to go with it, so see what sort of eyepieces you get with it as well. Uh, some of them you may get a finder with that'll help you find things in the night sky that are a bit more tricky to spot. And you might get some free stuff chucked in like star charts, computer programs. If they're gonna chuck in some free stuff, you may as well take advantage of everything you can get as well. Also worth thinking about, do you wanna take photos with the telescope? Because certain Telescopes are going to let you take photos with a proper camera, other ones you may be able to mount your mobile onto it to take photos. So really look 
if you want to take photos of what sort of camera you can use with that telescope. So they are really some of the main things you want to look at when it comes to a telescope. So my main advice would be to decide what you want to use your telescope for, uh, set yourself a budget and then see what sort of telescope you can get for your money as well. Remember to always check out reviews. Uh, if you're interested in the photography site, uh, have a look at other people's photos, what they've taken as well using the telescope too. And um, really, after you've got the telescope, there's three main pieces of advice I just want to give. Number one, you're not seeing anything if there's clouds, okay? No matter how big your telescope is, so you're going to want to look at the night sky on a clear evening, uh, rural area, preferably after midnight when all street lights are off. Uh, remember as well uh, that the Earth is spinning, so if you line something up to look at something, say the moon or a certain star, you'll find a few minutes later it may have disappeared from your view. Uh, you may want to start to making sure you turn the telescope to make sure you follow that. And if you do want to look at the moon, do not look at it when it is a full moon, please. Okay, you, you're probably just going to be blinded, to be honest with you. You won't see any detail. The best time to look at the moon is when it's a half moon or slightly less than a half moon. Okay, that's when you're going to see all that detail uh, where the moon goes from light to dark. That's where you're going to see your craters. So really, uh, that's the, my main advice when it comes to telescopes as well. So my name is Alex, and uh, hopefully we'll see you looking in the night sky very soon. Thanks Alex, and I'm sure that'll be a great help for anybody considering buying a telescope and getting into astronomy. Now during lockdown, uh, we've been joined by some amazing volunteers who have produced some content for us to continue our mission online. One of those volunteers is Hayley, who's been sending us a monthly updates of what you can see in the night sky. Now I'm sure you've enjoyed those videos as much as we have. Now Hayley has uh, provided us with another video, so it's over to you Hayley, as we look at how to observe the moon. Hi, I'm Hayley and today I'm here to talk to you about observing the moon. The moon is a fantastic target for beginning astronomers and experienced ones alike. There's so much to see and because it's so big and bright, there's no need to travel to a dark location or buy any special equipment. All you need to do is pop out into your garden or stand on your doorstep and look up. Most of what I'm going to talk about today will be visible to the naked eye. I will talk a little bit about what you can see with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope if you do have access to them. If you're going to be trying to identify some of the fainter features of the moon, it's worth letting your eyes adapt to the dark for about 20 minutes before you start. And when you go out to observe, you could take a map of the moon with you and a red torch to enable you to see it. And a red torch will enable you to see without ruining the dark adaption that we just spoke about. Um, if you want to do some sketching, you could also take a clipboard uh, and some paper and a pencil so that you can sketch what you see. If you're not sure whether the moon is visible tonight or you would like to know what phase it's going to be, you can check online. There are lots of websites that will give you that information or you can download some planetarium software. The software that I'm using at the moment is called Stellarium and that is free to download onto your mobile phone or onto your computer. The moon is what we call tidally locked to the Earth and that means we only ever see one face of it. And um, that's because it rotates at the same speed as it orbits the Earth. And we call the side that we can see the near side of the moon. And taking a look now at the near side of the moon, you will see patches of grey. And these are known as the lunar seas or Maria. And they're still known as seas today, even though we now know they're not made of water at all, but are in fact solidified lava flows of basaltic rock and they were formed after huge meteorite impacts would create a basin that would then fill up with magma. The lighter coloured areas that you can see here are known as the lunar highlands and they show the oldest rock on the moon. What I'm going to do now is take you through some of the main seas and whereabouts they're located on the moon and then I'll talk some about some of the craters on the moon as well. Let's begin with the Mare Imbrium, or Sea of Showers, which I'm ringing with my mouse now. Uh, it's a huge circular sea, um, around 760 miles in diameter. If you look at the northwestern edge of the Sea of Showers, you come to what's known as the Cenus Iridum, which is the Bay of Rainbows, um, which is this little piece that is popping out of the edge of the Sea of Showers. Um, 
if you want to try and spot it with your naked eye you might be able to especially if it's close to the terminator but you really would want a pair of binoculars or a small telescope to be able to see it clearly to the east of the sea of showers we find the slightly smaller mare serenitatis the sea of serenity which is around 400 miles across and to the east of that again roughly the same size we come to the mare tranquillitatis which is the sea of tranquility probably the most famous sea on the moon because it was the location of the Apollo 11 first lunar landing where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first people to walk on the moon. Um, Apollo 11's Tranquility Base is located close to the southern shore of the Sea of Tranquility. To the east of the Sea of Tranquility we have the Mare Fecunditatis or the Sea of Fertility uh, which I'm ringing with my mouse now. Uh, similar size to the Sea of Tranquility, not quite as easy to make out. Now, if we look at the join between the Sea of Tranquility and the Sea of Fertility, if we go immediately above, we find um, the Sea of Crises um, or the Mare Crisium. And that is a, an isolated sea, roughly 350 miles across, um, quite easy to pick out. The site of the Luna 15 Soviet probe crash in 1969 and also the site of the Luna 24 uh, Soviet probe which returned a sample from there in 1976. And if we go below the join um, down to this much less distinct small sea um, which is the Mare Nectaris or the Sea of Nectar. Um, and that can be tricky to spot because it's not as dark as the other seas so it doesn't stand out quite as well um, from the surrounding highlands. Going over to the other side now and I'm ringing the Oceanus Preselarum which is the Ocean of Storms and the Ocean of Storms is the largest of all of the seas on the moon and is uh, about a thousand miles long mm. um, so it's quite easy to spot as long as the phase of the moon is close to full. Uh, it's also the site of the Apollo 12 lunar landing. Um, moving across from the ocean of storms over here we have the Mare Nubium or the Sea of Clouds. Um, not quite so easy to spot because it doesn't have very strong edges to it. Um, and if we look below it, just here, um, we have the Mare hum Humorum, uh, the Sea of Moisture. And although it's much smaller than the Sea of Clouds, it's easier to spot because it just um, stands out a little bit better. Um, and finally, the final uh, sea that I want to talk to you about is the Mare Frigoris, which is the Sea of Cold, all the way back up to the north of the moon. And it's a long, snaking sea that goes all the way along here. So I'm just ringing it with my mouse now. Um, so the Sea of Cold, and um, it runs all the way from um, the ocean of storms along the top of the um, sea of showers um, until it makes contact with the sea of serenity. Thanks Hayley, I'm sure people will be looking forward to looking at the moon on a clear night. Now in true Blue Peter style, here's one I prepared earlier uh, and I'm going to be showing you how to make your very own moon rocks. Now we're really lucky at the National Space Centre because we have a lunar sample on display in our rocket tower thanks to our friends at NASA. Now that lunar sample was returned in December 1972 thanks to two astronauts on the Apollo 17 space mission which was the last Apollo mission to leave the moon. Now those two astronauts were Harrison Schmidt and Jean Cernan and they collected our lunar sample from a boulder uh, that was fractured on the edge of the Shorty crater and you can see that right now in our rocket tower. 
Now moon rock is actually really rare. There's only around 430 kilograms here on the Earth's surface, which equates to about 0.02% of the amount of gold mined on Earth last year alone. Of the six Apollo moon missions that brought lunar samples back, they brought around 2,415 samples, which equates to about 382 kilograms. The Soviets' lunar 16, 20 and 24 missions brought back around 386 grams, so a relatively small amount. The other 48 kilograms is made up from lunar meteorites that have landed here on Earth. Now, if you want to know more about lunar samples, and particularly the Apollo space mission lunar samples, then please do go to our website and read the fantastic blog that has been created by our curator, Dan. Right, so to make your moon rock, you're going to need 700 grams of bicarbonate of soda, 70 millilitres of water, some glitter, I have a selection of here, with including gold and pearlescent and all colours here, um, some food colouring uh, and then a bowl to mix it in and a spatula and that's all you're going to need. Now I want my moon rocks to be really sparkly so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add lots of glitter so I'm adding gold and like I say there's lots going in there and then I really like this one pearlescent and I think that that's going to be beautiful in our moon rocks because I'm going to be adding black food colouring to this. So all you're gonna do is mix in your glitter. We can always add more, so you can never take away, but you can always add more. Uh, and then I'm gonna add our water. So that just goes straight in there. Uh, and then I'm gonna give that a mix around. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to be adding some color. Okay, so I've added the glitter and the water and it started to come together. Uh, and now we're gonna add the color. So I'm going for black and uh, lots of colour in there and then all we're going to do is mix this through now this is going to take some time so instead of you watching me making uh, uh, a lot of mess in my kitchen uh, come back in just a moment's time and I'll show you it finished so this is the consistency you're looking for. I have a nice gray color and it's really sparkly. And now for the fun part, we're gonna get our hands in there and we're gonna make some moon rocks. So you're just gonna press it very firmly. You can make any shapes you want. So you can push your fingers in to make some craters, but do realize that it's actually very fragile and it can break apart. So you just need to be quite firm with it. All you're gonna do then is leave it overnight to dry and then your moon rocks will be ready in the morning. That's it. So if you do have a go at making moon rocks, please do share your photographs. We'd love to see what you make. Now, if you want to use these for some science experiments, go back and watch how Charlie created impact craters. And you can use your moon rocks to do that as well. Now, please remember, don't eat these. They're not very tasty. Other than that, stay safe and huge thanks for your support. I can't wait to welcome you to the National Space Centre again very soon. Well, she was good, wasn't she? In all seriousness, we can't wait to welcome you back to the National Space Centre. We're open every Friday, Saturday and the Sunday. And do check our website for the exciting and safe activities that we have going on here every week. Uh, now it's back to Hayley, who's going to show you how you can look at the craters on the moon. Let's move on to craters now. And I'm going to talk to you about six craters that you would, might like to have a go at spotting. The first four that I'm going to talk about, you might be able to pick out with the naked eye. Certainly Tycho, the first one, you should definitely be able to pick that out with your naked eye. The others, it will depend on the conditions and how good your vision is. Um, if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, then they will look even better. And the final two craters that I'm going to talk about, you're definitely going to need a pair of binoculars or a telescope to spot those. So the first one, which is arguably the most spectacular crater on the moon, is the Tycho Crater. I'm just putting my mouse pointer next to it now. Um, and it's about 50 miles across. And one of the things that makes it so spectacular is it has this amazing ray system of ejected material and those rays spread outwards from the crater across the moon. Um, and you can just see I'm following a couple of those with my mouse now. And one of the rays spreads all the way to the Sea of Serenity. So see if you can trace that ray all the way up to the Sea of Serenity. The second um, 
crater that I would like to talk to you about is the Kepler crater. So my mouse is on the Kepler crater now, um, and that is located next to another bright crater, Copernicus. So these two craters, Kepler and Copernicus, you can have a go at spotting those together. Um, and they are also ray craters. Um, so they, the ray systems look uh, particularly good when um, the um, illumination is overhead, so when the moon is full. Um, and it, the, the system of rays makes the craters themselves a little bit easier to spot as well. Uh, Kepler is fairly small, um, about 20 miles across, um, and Copernicus larger, uh, its diameter is about 56 miles, so it's a little bit easier to see. Uh, and if you do have a telescope, um, if you look at Copernicus, this one, um, with your telescope you can see lots of detail um, inside the crater so it has um, terraced walls that you can pick out and it also has three central mountain peaks um, that you can try and spot with your telescope as well. Uh, crater number four, this one here, my mouse next to it now, is called Aristarchus um, and that is the brightest feature on the near side of the moon um, and the reason it's so bright is that it is relatively young so um, formed within the last billion years um, and it also stands out because it is located within the dark ocean of storms, so um, you can see this bright splodge in an otherwise dark ocean. Um, so the final two craters I'm going to talk about, which are Plato and Grimaldi, are a little bit different to the four that I've told you about already because they are dark craters. Um, the craters we've talked about so far are bright craters and these ones are older, so the crater floors are darker, which can make them a little bit harder to spot and you will want to have a pair of binoculars or a telescope to be able to see these ones. Um, so moving to uh, Plato to start with, and you can see that my mouse is on the Plato crater now. Um, and if you look at Plato with a pair of binoculars, um, you will see that it is quite distinctive. And if you have a telescope, um, you might be able to spot that it has some little craters um, within the floor of the crater as well. Um, and finally, Grimaldi down here, um, and that is it's a big crater, 134 miles across, so um, quite a lot bigger than Plato, um, so it's uh, fairly large and um, actually looks a little bit like a mini sea rather than a crater. Thanks Hayley, we'll be looking for those lunar craters on our next viewing session. Now if you want to make your very own lunar craters and you fancy being crafty with a science twist, it's time to join Charlie who's going to show you just that. My name's Charlie and I'm going to show you how to create your very own crater investigation. So first of all, let's have a look at how these craters are formed. An object from space, which could be an asteroid, which is a large rocky body left over from the beginning of our solar system, or a comet, we sometimes call a giant dirty snowball made of frozen gases and rock, or even a meteoroid, which is a fragment of one of these two objects. It's called a meteoroid when it's in space, a meteorite that's coming through the atmosphere, and a meteorite once it's landed. These could impact onto a rocky body at high speed, something like a planet, a moon, or an asteroid, and they create these craters, these bowl shapes on the surface of these rocky bodies. What you're going to need for this investigation is some flour, any type of flour is fine, or you could even use the moon dust that you created last week if you kept it in an airtight tub. You need a tray or an empty ice cream tub, not something too big because we're going to fill it with quite a lot of flour, about an inch thick. Then you'll need a pebble or some marbles or even a ball bearing, whatever you've got available. You'll need a ruler or maybe a measuring tape and we've used a mat to make sure we don't make too much mess. Now what we're going to be investigating is what difference the height makes to the drop of our impactor, our pebble in this case. So you might want to predict which will create the biggest crater, the higher the drop, the lower the drop, or will it all be the same? Let's try this out. 
So the first thing we did is my helper put a mat on the table and then she got her flour ready and poured it into our tub, about an inch thick, so we had something nice to drop a pebble into. And then we're ready to measure. Next, we dropped our pebble from different heights, starting at 40 centimetres and repeated this process again and again until we had enough results. What did you find out? Which made the biggest crater? Was it from a higher height or a lower height? Or were they all pretty much the same? We'd love to see your results. Please can you share them with us on social media, Instagram or Facebook. Thank you very much for joining us and I hope to see you again soon. Bye bye everyone. Thank you, Charlie. Brilliant fun for all the family. Now it's time for Answers with Anu. And we asked him the question, why did the Apollo missions go to the moon? Hello, I'm Anu Ojar from the National Space Centre. And today I want to explain why nearly 60 years ago, there was an epic race to get the first human beings onto the surface of this, the moon, nearly quarter of a million miles away. Now, I'd like to say that the reason the United States and the Soviet Union were racing each other was in the name of science. But actually, it wasn't. It was all down to politics. Because after World War II, what emerged were two competing political systems. It was communism against capitalism, the Soviet Union against the United States. And what better way to show the rest of the world the superiority of your system than by getting human beings not only to the final frontier, getting into space, but getting to the moon and back again. And that was the reason why President Kennedy set one of the boldest national goals that the United States has ever seen, the challenge of Project Apollo. Fantastic answer there, Anu, and thank you so much. Don't forget, if you have any questions for our Discovery team, just use the hashtag AskUsAboutSpace. So let's have a look at those all-important Apollo landing sites, and it's over to you, Will. Hi, my name's Will here at the National Space Centre, and for International Observe the Moon Night, I'm going to be talking a bit about where on the moon the Apollo missions landed. Now from 1969 to 1972 there would be six successful missions down to the surface of the moon and all of the sites were chosen on the near side of the moon. This is the site that always faces the planet Earth. This would be crucial for the success of the mission as it allowed astronauts to stay in constant contact with the mission control team down on the planet Earth. Now each of the sites was chosen for many different reasons. First of all, it had to be of scientific interest, but it also needed to be safe as well. An area for a landing needed to be relatively smooth and also free of any big craters, hills and cliffs, which could affect the radar systems on the landing craft. Now for Apollo 11, the astronauts chose, uh, NASA chose this area here called the Sea of Tranquility. The lunar surface is covered in these dark patches, which we call seas, due to a misconception from early astronomers that they were in fact seas on the surface of the moon. So Apollo 11 landed here at the bottom part of this dark patch called the Sea of Tranquility. For Apollo 12, they would land over here in what's called the Oceanus Prolocarum. This area is home to valleys and hills of particular scientific interest. For Apollo 14, they would land here in the Frau Moro region, and Apollo 15, 16, and 17, the astronauts had access to a lunar rover, which meant that they could drive around the surface of the moon, cover a lot more ground, and Apollo 15 landed in one of the highest areas on the near side of the moon, called the Hadley Rills, or Apennine Mountains. For Apollo 16, they landed here in the Descartes Highlands, and Apollo 17, the final mission, landed in the Taurus Littro region. Now, you're not going to be able to actually see the sites themselves from the Earth without any serious equipment, um, but you can make out the regions where they landed. So next time you go out and see the moon in the sky, do see if you can make out the Sea of Tranquility, maybe the Oceanus Prolocarum as well. They're really interesting things to go out and have a look at. But if you do want to get a closer look, NASA have actually been photographing the landing sites using the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a very powerful camera that's actually been able to take pictures that can make out some of the equipment that they left on the surface of the moon.
Thanks, Will. Some great images there from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Now it's time to hear from an actual Apollo astronaut. Charlie Duke visited the National Space Center in 2010, and here's an amazing story he had to tell. Mattingly lost his wedding ring inside the spacecraft on the second day. Well, we landed on the moon on the fourth day, and on the seventh day we left and rendezvoused, and he's still looking for this ring now, five days later. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, started home on the eighth day, uh, and on the ninth day we had a spacewalk, or EVA, and we were about 180,000 miles from the Earth. and. Uh, so uh, the, the plan was John, uh, John would stay inside and Mattingly and I would get outside and he was the, and I was a safety observer really. So he fl floats out first and goes to the back of the spacecraft to start his experiments and I float out and just sort of hooked my feet in the side of the hatch and w had his lifeline and was sort of a safety guy. And uh, so I didn't have anything to do and the earth was beautiful over here and the moon was up here. And, so after about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, I floated back inside because he was finished at the back. Now he had an experiment to do that was anchored to the hatch uh, by a three meter pole. So 10 feet away was this biological experiment. So he climbs out and, and is working on this experiment with his back to me. And, I, and I'm watching this, the sun's glistening uh, off of him and it's just you know, a beautiful sight. And something catches my eye, and I look over, and there's his wedding ring floating uh, out <laughs> the hatch. Uh, and it's just slowly moving, and I'm at the bottom of the spacecraft, and, and I get wedged in, so I, by the time I broke loose, uh, I, I, I floated after it, and it just cleared the hatch, and I grabbed for it, and I missed it. So it was lost in space is my, <laughs> my thought. And so, it, and, and then the sun hit it, and it's just glistening in the sunlight, rolling over and tumbling, and slowly floated out. About five minutes later, it hit him on the back of the head. Uh, now, the physics of a round helmet and a round ring colliding, and then where's it gonna go? The possibility of doing a 180 degree bounce and coming back for the hatch is almost zero, but that's exactly what it did. So it hit, hit, it hit the helmet and it started slowly back towards the hatch and about five minutes later it floated back into the hatch right in front of my face and I grabbed it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of the story. Happy ending. Thanks, Charlie. Your visit really inspired a lot of people and I sincerely hope we can start welcoming guests to the National Space Centre very soon. Now we're going to be joining Katie in the Sir Patrick Moore Planetarium to learn about the phases of the Moon. Now if you go to our website you can download and make your very own phases of the Moon. Just go to the website, click on the What's On section and then click Spacecrafts and you'll find loads of downloadable resources that you can do at home. I'm Katie and here at the National Space Centre today we are in the planetarium to learn all about the phases of the moon. Now for this we're going to need three things. First of all, the Earth, which today is going to be represented by you guys at home. So uh, could you hold this for me please? We're also going to need the Sun, which is going to be represented by a light. Now my colleague Josh is over there, so uh, Josh if you could catch the Sun please. Finally, of course, we need the moon, which today is represented by me. We see the moon in the sky because the sun's light is reflecting off its surface. And when we think of the moon in the sky, we often think of this phase here, the full moon. But as the moon moves through its 28-day orbit, we start to see different shapes or phases. We're going to take a look at those now. So a couple of days into the orbit, that shadow starts to creep in. We see an almost full moon, and this is called the waning gibbous. A couple more days later, we're seven days in. That's a quarter of the way through, and we can see a quarter of the moon lit up. So you might have guessed it, this one's called the last quarter. A couple more days later, that shadow has crept almost entirely over. 
we have this thin strip of light here, which we call a crescent shape. We name it the waning crescent. And 14 days in, we're halfway through our orbit. At this point, the moon is completely in shadow. It's very difficult for us to spot, and we call it a new moon. So we're halfway through our orbit, and as we continue our orbit, that light's going to start creeping back in, and our moon's going to start looking bigger. Now, you may have noticed that I've been using the word waning so far, and waning simply means getting smaller. So now that our moon's going to start getting bigger, we're going to use a different word called waxing. And you've probably guessed it, that means getting bigger. So a couple of more days into our orbit, we start to see our moon getting a little bigger. We see that crescent shape reappearing, and we call this our waxing crescent. A couple more days in, we come to three quarters of the way through the orbit. Once again, you can see a quarter of the moon, and this is called our first quarter. A couple more days later, we can see almost all of the moon lit up. Can you remember what phase that was called? You got it, it was a gibbous. So we call this the waxing gibbous. And finally, 28 days later, we return back to our starting position, where the moon is fully lit up, we can see all of it, and once again, we call it a full moon. So today, we've learned all about the phases of the moon. And now that you know them, why not try checking them out for yourself out of your bedroom window over the next couple of weeks? Great to see you there again, Katie, and I can't wait to see your new workshops in our Live Space Gallery from this Friday. Uh, now over to Hayley, who's going to show us how you can look at the real phases of the moon. So let's take a look at the phases of the moon now and have a talk about what we might want to look out for at different phases. So I'll start with a new moon. So I'm just going to take us to the 16th of October because I know that the moon will be new around then. Um, and if we move time onwards by a day with each click you can see that the crescent moon is coming into view um, and when the moon is going towards full like this we say it's waxing so we have a waxing crescent coming into view and can start to see the sea of crises coming into view here um, and as we move towards first quarter then you can look out for um, the Sea of Tranquility and the Sea of Serenity coming into view as well. And remember, look along this terminator line, the line between um, light and shadow, and those features along that line are going to be much more prominent because of the shadows that are cast. Um, as we move past first quarter, when the moon is half illuminated, and towards a waxing gibbous moon, then um, the Tycho crater starts to come into view um, and also the Apennine mountain range which um, is a range of mountains that sits between the Sea of Serenity and the Sea of Showers um, and can be really nice to look at with a telescope um, when it's near to the Terminator. As we move towards full, um, so moving our gibbous uh, face towards full you can see Plato coming into view and Copernicus followed by Kepler as well um, coming into view uh, and then finally we see the ocean of storms um, along with the uh, craters Aristarchus and Grimaldi as well and then as we go through the month past the full moon you can see the whole thing happening in reverse um, and again you can explore um, the features of the moon that lie along the terminator as it wanes towards a new moon. Thank you Hayley and for all your help during lockdown you've been absolutely fantastic so on behalf of the charity thank you so much. Now we have to go out with a bang or maybe even a forward roll so over to Claire who's going to talk about Artemis. Oh. 
Artemis is the Greek goddess of the moon, the twin sister of Apollo, so it's fitting that Artemis has been chosen as the name of NASA's spaceflight program to send the first woman and the next man to the moon's south pole in 2024. The program includes the Lunar Gateway, a station around the moon that will be a staging post for missions to the moon's surface and onto Mars. It will have a halo orbit around the moon, providing easy access to Earth and more of the moon's surface, as well as a deep space environment for experiments. It might not be involved in the 2024 landing, but its construction is being planned. It will be launched by the Space Launch System, a huge new rocket for four-person crews. It will be two and a half times the size of our rocket tower, and more powerful than the Saturn V. The first launch of the SLS is scheduled to be Artemis One, a test flight to send an uncrewed spacecraft around the moon in November 2021, in preparation for the 2024 landing. The Orion spacecraft will carry the astronauts, it's similar to the Apollo Command and Service module. ESA and the UK company Airbus is building a European service module, which will provide propulsion, power, air and water for the astronauts, as well as thermal control of the entire spacecraft. There's already been successful tests. Other commercial companies and space agencies, including Japan, will contribute things such as lunar landers to take astronauts to the surface and provide surface operations. Unlike the Apollo program, this is an international effort. Some of NASA's 22nd astronaut group, nicknamed the Turtles, will fly on the Artemis missions to the Moon, and may be the first crew to fly to Mars. Artemis can almost be seen as a dress rehearsal for reaching Mars. On the Moon, they'll be finding and using water, learning to live and work on another celestial body, and testing their technologies to make this all happen. So prepare yourself for 2024, where we'll hopefully see a woman walk on the Moon. Now, it probably won't be me, but I can dream. Now I'm here with some of the artifacts uh, that are all about eating in space. So maybe you fancy a dehydrated tuna salad from Apollo 16. If not, how about from the Russian space missions of the 90s, some vacuum-packed peas in milk? If not, how about a lovely astronomical treat thanks to Sophie? Let's go and check out how she's doing. Thanks Malika and welcome back to our Lunar Truffle recipe. Now I've taken these out of the freezer and they've just got hard enough that I can coat them in melted chocolate. Now that chocolate is not just there for deliciousness, but it's there to represent what happens to our lunar meteorite when it's made its journey from the moon towards the earth. As it slams into our upper atmosphere, it squashes those gases together, compresses them, and forms something called a superheated plasma. Now at these extremely high temperatures, the outside of our meteorite begins to melt, and small bubbles of gases trapped inside will bubble out, leaving a melted, slightly bubbly surface called a fusion crust. We're going to show that with our melted chocolate. Now, you can use whatever method you prefer for melting your chocolate. Some people might want to do it in a water bath. I personally am going to use my microwave. I'm going to put it into the microwave and take it out every 10 to 15 seconds, give it a stir, pop it back in and repeat that until all the chocolate has melted, but it is important that you keep checking to make sure that the chocolate doesn't burn. So uh, I'll see you once I've done that. So after six lots of 15 second bursts, I've got my fusion crust ready to go onto our meteorite. And so what we need to do is carefully lift up our truffle, drop it into the chocolate, and just kind of roll it around. It doesn't need to be completely covered, but just enough that we get that little bit of a fusion crust. And we lift it up and pop it back onto the baking paper. And we're going to repeat this for all of our truffles. So pop it in, get it nicely covered in our chocolate. and then pop it back into our container. All the while fighting the temptation to eat them straight away. Good 
get a lovely fusion crust forming on these. And once you've got the chocolate back onto these, we are going to pop them back into the freezer just for about half an hour to give that chocolate fusion crust time to set. And then we'll be ready for the best bit, the taste test. So we will cover this last one with the remains of our chocolate. There's our lovely melted, slightly bubbly surface. And we'll pop the lid back on, stick it in the freezer for about another half an hour, and then these will be ready to try. And just to save time, here's some I made earlier. So my truffles have had enough time now for that melted chocolate fusion crust to harden. I think it might be time to give it a go. Here we have our lunar meteorite and mm, it's a really creamy filling. So there we have it. We have our dark Oreo filling here representing our basalt. We have our nuts or our biscuit representing our anorthosite. Do you know what? I don't think this is a bad model. So hopefully now, when you step outside to observe the moon, you can eat your very own version of a lunar meteorite. It's pretty similar, but I definitely know which one of these I'd prefer to eat. I hope you have a brilliant evening and enjoy the rest of International Observe the Moon Night. And that's it, we exit stage left with a comedy moonwalk and something sweet and indulgent from Sophie. I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed spending the evening with us here at the National Space Centre and that we've inspired you to go out and observe the moon. Now don't forget we are open every Friday, Saturday and Sunday during school term time and will be open throughout the October half term period. But we have significantly reduced the number of tickets that are available to ensure your safety and the safety of our staff. So booking in advance is essential. Our discovery teams are still working from home and they're going to be creating lots more content that we'll be sharing with you on our social media channels. So we hope you continue to enjoy and join us on our online mission. Other than that, stay safe and 